Uh, it's been really cool and uh, enjoyable today. Um, I don't often get to talk about work stuff and tech with, uh, with such a diverse group of people. Normally, uh, I'm in this kind of group. Well, it might be hard to spot me there, but uh, there I am. So th actually, this is just a group of snowboarders, but they're quite monolithic <laughs> other than myself, and that was my point. Mostly when I get to talk about tech or work with uh, design and technology, I'm working in a monolithic group that doesn't represent me. This actually is a more representative picture of actual work experience. That's me in an office doing my work. And uh, <laughs> every time I look at this photo, uh, it looks more and more like I was photoshopped in. <laughs> Do you agree? <laughs> totally. The thing is that that's, I feel photoshopped into the workspaces I find myself in. I feel like I'm an artificial uh, insertion into those spaces. I have a better picture that represents, yeah. That, okay, which one is me? <laughs> that's, that's me. This is how I feel in most workspaces. I find myself an alien, like sort of uh, the only one. Often I'm the only black guy. Often I'm the only parent. Uh, often I'm the only one traumatized by my Twitter feed on a daily basis. Uh, and it's hard. It can be hard. I can't work under those circumstances. I can't show up to work inspired when I feel alone and isolated. Um, none of us should. The thing is that, uh, well, I don't want to waste my time. So when I do show up to work, I want to be comfortable. I want to feel good. I want to be productive. And if I'm in a workspace, if I don't feel those things, I tend to want to go talk to someone who's in control, talk to a manager or something, and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling good. This isn't working for me. But you know what? When I do that, often, I get this kind of reaction. This, this is not a boss I've ever had. This guy, I think he's like the CEO of Chase Bank or something. Anyway, look at him. But this is, this is the face I get. It's sort of like, sorry for you. I uh, can't do anything. Uh, maybe it's a bad culture fit? OK, yeah, it's probably a bad culture fit. But that whole bad culture fit thing, I reject it. Because it puts undue uh, responsibility and burden on me as an individual, whereas you, a company, uh, uh, an organization has, the, has created a culture and inserted me into that culture. So how is it now my problem that this culture doesn't work for me? But anyway, that's the face that I often get, and I, I resent it. Also, it's not strategic on a business level. Think about it. You invest in people to help you make a product or service or launch a movement or whatever you're doing. Uh, if it's a bad culture, it's not only the individual's problem, it's the organization's problem. It's the product's problem. It's the service's problem. So maybe I can give a little more, a little more context. Uh, I used to manage a recording studio in uh, downtown New York City. It was called The Cutting Room, really great place. By the way, I'm, I turned 40 this year and I've had like 10 different careers in my life, which I think is an asset. That is, uh, I'm very happy about that. They've all been really uh, informative, really creative, really uh, yeah, educational. And uh, so while I was managing a recording studio, I would often talk to engineers. I also got to talk to really cool artists like The Roots, Most Deaf, Mary J. Blige, it was really great. These guys, the engineers that tended to be behind the boards, controlling machines, they had a saying, uh, a phrase that they would often throw out there. They would say, shit in, shit out. <laughs> shit in, shit out. It's not a mantra. It's basically their description of the reality that no matter how, uh, how awesome the board you have is, no matter how great the speakers or no matter how finely tuned your auto-tunes is, if the music going in is crap, then the result is going to be crap. Um, they're describing a system. And the, the truth is that when systems produce things, if the system is crap, the result is going to be crap. Crap in, crap out. Uh, obviously, it's not unique to the music industry. And it's a notion that uh, I think is relevant to uh, any, any system. Let's talk about these systems. So workplace culture is a system, right? 
Uh, it's made up of, not crap, but it's made up of, uh, <laughs> uh, of different parts, right? People, uh, history, uh, rules, social norms. But most workplace systems, to be honest, are broken. So how do we fix broken systems? We hack them. We put on our hoodies and get to our keyboards. <laughs> well, no, we don't, we should hack them, but not this kind of hacking, not this kind of hacking. I mean more like this kind of hacking, like creative thinking, okay? This doesn't require a keyboard, although a keyboard may help you. But the kind of hacking I'm talking about is thinking creatively about how to affect a change in a system. Since workplaces are dynamic systems made up of people, history, rules, social norms, these things may interact. These are dynamic systems made up of parts that interact. As a designer, actually, that's exactly how I understand every design challenge. It's a system made up of parts that may interact. Sidebars, buttons, backgrounds, uh, form factors, these are all systems. So if I'm identifying the workplace as a system and it needs change, then I'm gonna approach it like a designer and I'm gonna suggest to you how you might do it as well. I approach it like a designer, but I also approach it like a DJ. I design using rethinking, using remixing, uh, resampling or sampling, rearranging. This, these are the things I do with design projects. Also with DJing, I'm a DJ, that's me. By the way, look me up on SoundCloud slash Humble. <laughs> Want to hear my mixtape? Anyone? No? Okay, let's move on. Uh, so here's the thing. To change a broken but complex system, I have devised four <laughs> strategic principles. They come from the world of design, at least the way I approach design, and I want to share them with you today. Okay, number one, analyze. Or actually, for the British people in here, analyze. Uh, Analyze your environment, okay? Look at the system itself. What characterizes the strengths and the weaknesses of the system as you see it? Also, think about what characterizes the strengths and the weaknesses of the system for everyone else around you. That's key. It's not really just about you. If you're uncomfortable in your workplace, someone else is too. It's guaranteed. Okay, one, analyze. Two, break something, my favorite part. So, it's not just a random destruction. When I say break something, I mean find the seams in your environment, the seams, seams, joints. Find the overlapping or uh, find the areas of overlap or the areas of lack of responsibility or accountability. Find those seams and insert yourself there. Uh, there's a woman named Cindy Gallup. Yeah, Cindy Gallup. She, is, um, she t talks often about how to change the gender dynamic in workplaces. And she, she suggests an approach that uses micro actions. So she says, find something to do that is small scale, but that sh slowly shifts the paradigm of your workplace. I think it's a good idea. There's a good analogy that comes from physiology. Uh, if you think about how the body reacts when someone is working out, lifting weights and so forth, what's happening is that they're actually slowly and microscopically tearing the tendons in their body. You're working out, you're actually hurting yourself. You're slowly destroying your muscles. But the thing is, the body is amazing. And this is why I want to use it as an analogy because when you're working out, yes, you're destroying yourself, but your body as a system is also healing itself. It takes, it basically looks at the, the, the breakage and replaces it with a better design. It heals it and thus makes it stronger. I'm not a biology major, so I don't know. I think it works out. I asked the internet. It said yes. Um, so break something. Analyze, break something. But like the body does, redesign something to put in place of what's broken. The last concept that's part of this approach that I'll mention today is to measure and adjust. Now, I'm taking these things from design, right? I'm a designer. This is how I look at design challenges. I try to understand them all, the whole system. I say, where is it weak? Let me push in there, break it, and then improve it with something even better. But how do I know it's better? I have to measure. I have to 
measure, I have to observe its use, and then adjust accordingly. Uh, the adjustment thing is interesting too because success in terms of changing uh, environments doesn't have to be a binary thing. Uh, you don't win or lose necessarily, but designing a solution that works can be something that is, uh, let's say, varying in degrees of fidelity. Uh, yeah. Okay, I can even give you some examples. Let me give you some examples of how I've used this in my workplaces. But first, I have to warn you. <laughs> I'm going to suggest you do some things, but this is risky, actually. Uh, you could get fired. The thing is, what I'm saying is you should go into a workplace and start challenging ideas. But in many workplaces, when you start to challenge existing ideas, people think you're actually disagreeing with them personally. People think that you are challenging who they are. It's not true, but this is what happens in the distortion lens of or workplaces. Uh, depending on who you're challenging, you might end up on the losing end of a, uh, a power struggle, you know, like the one where you're struggling and someone's wielding power. But uh, look, it's a risk. If you can accept it, then maybe this approach will work for you. It has worked for me. Uh, three years ago, I moved from Brooklyn to Amsterdam to do design work for a large e-commerce company in the accommodation space. If you've ever been to Amsterdam, that will not be a mystery who that company is. Uh, but it doesn't really matter in this case. Before moving, I didn't really know much about Amsterdam. Well, I knew a little bit, you know, like the tulips and the bicycles and stuff, and, uh, and the red light district, all cool and progressive stuff sometimes. Uh, so when faced with the opportunity, I said, should I leave the States and move to the Netherlands? Yeah, why not? W what could go wrong? This, this could go wrong. This went wrong. This is wrong. <laughs> this is Dutch. And this is a tradition called Zwarte Piet. Have you heard of it? Quick survey? Okay, you can look it up. Basically, it's a, it's a newish tradition, actually. It hasn't been around for more than 200 years. It's a, 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 a cultural tradition where they celebrate around Christmas time. There's a character they call Zwarte Piet, which in Dutch means Black Piet. And people who are not black go into blackface and wear these costumes and they have fun with children handing out candies and cookies. And it's, I find it disgusting and offensive. And uh, I was shocked at my new job in, <laughs> in Amsterdam to be going through the employee handbook. And I saw a picture taking place in the office of Zwarte Piet and colleagues. I said, okay, that's not gonna work for me. It immediately made me feel defensive and isolated, and I had to do something about it. I wasn't going to come into work every day and, and think about Zorte Pete. I was there to do design. So I had to do some analysis. I went back to my approach. I said, okay, what's the system? Who's in charge here? Who can I go to? And I started to ask around. I asked people, look, I have a problem with something we do here in the office. Who can I go to and voice my concerns? And nobody knew. Just, you know, they were like, what? First of all, they were like, what's the problem? <laughs> they were like, you don't like Zorte Beat? He's so cute, so lovable. No. Uh, so at first, I did not have success, but one day a lawyer came to me, a company lawyer, came to me at my desk. He's like, hey, can we talk? I'm like, yeah, okay, who are you? He's like, yeah, I'm a lawyer, I'm one of the lead counsels. I heard you, you know, have some concerns. Uh, so let's talk. I said, yes, cool, okay. This was my opportunity. I didn't know uh, what I was going to be able to achieve, but I did some analysis. I said, okay, a lawyer's here to talk to me. Lawyers at companies are people put in place to protect the company from losing money. It's a generalization, but I think if you think it through, it's always true. So I said, okay, this is about money. So my plan was to propose two options to the lawyer. I said, okay, this thing is racist to me. I hate it. I can't deal with it. Can we either, whenever there's Zorte P in the office, I'm gonna stay home, not work and get paid, or can you just not have Zorte P in the office? And the lawyer said, oh, that's a good, first he said, what's wrong with Zorte P? I was like, just, okay, that's my question, okay? He's like, okay, I'll, I'll think about the question and get back to you. Cool, so a couple weeks went by and he came back to me and he said, uh, hey, you know, I took your question to the local government because we didn't have an answer internally and the local government of the city of Amsterdam said, 
yeah, either pay the guy and let him stay home or change your, change your tradition. So the lawyer told me we decided as a company to change our tradition. I was like, yes, yes. I was like, yes, victory, I did it, I did it. So I got really, uh, I felt really, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I was encouraged. I felt great, I felt confident. I, uh, I would go into my meetings and I'd be like pushing seams all over the place. I was uh, just really bold in my, in my communication styles and coming up with great ideas that had nothing to do with the, <laughs> with the thing that I was working on, but they were really good ideas anyway. Um, I was feeling really good about this four-step approach. And then I got fired. <laughs> and I said, why would you fire me? What, what did I do? Did I push at the seam too hard? And the guy I was talking to was like, no, 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 it's just a bad culture fit. So, okay, bad culture fit. Too bad for them. So I left that company I went to another company and did UX and UI design. Much smaller company, it was about 40 people there. Uh, very flat structure, only a, a couple of managers. And um, the first week I was working there, a lot of people were coming up to me, like, whispering to me. Psst, they would say, Psst, hey, Kaid, I have this really great idea for the design of a product. I'm like, oh yeah, tell me, tell me. You know, and it was cool. I was getting all these ideas from people, but I noticed more and more, like, folks coming to me, pulling me aside, secretly saying, here's my idea, let's do this or that. And I was like, why are people coming to me secretly to share their great product ideas? But I figured it out. I learned, as soon as I started to offer my own product ideas that were constantly shut down, I learned that this place had a culture of killing ideas. There was some old like lifers, people who had been there their whole life basically, who had a disproportionate amount of decision making power. And whenever someone would come up with a contrary idea or new and interesting idea, those old school people would shut it down. They would kill the ideas. And I can't work like that. Uh, I refuse to. So I said, okay, I gotta do something here. I realized that innovation, which, which is core to a lot of technology companies, was something that, that was sort of, it wasn't surviving here. So there were no lawyers to turn to here. Even the worst offenders were people in management themselves. So my goal was to basically change the culture so that we could see ideas survive. So what I did was I started a type form survey and sent it to everybody in the company. I said, hey everybody, if I put on a hackathon here, if I organize a hackathon, would you participate? you might not be surprised that everyone was like, hell yeah, we'll do it. So, I sent a one-pager to management and I said, hey, this is what I plan to do. I'm gonna organize a hackathon. Everyone's gonna participate and it's gonna surface some really great ideas. Uh, we're going to use it to push innovation. We're gonna discover new products that we can push to the market. All this talk. But really what I was doing was creating an opportunity to improve the user experience of working at that company. It had very little to do with any product. But as we know, hackathons have these you know, uh, additional benefits anyway. The first hackathon I did was a great success. People loved it. I offered people a chance to break out of their routines, uh, to work with teams that they didn't, didn't usually get to work with. It was really cool. I sent out a survey after the first hackathon to ask for feedback. I incorporated that feedback like any good user designer, user experience designer would. I put those pieces of feedback into the next iteration of the hackathon. And we did three hackathons in my time at that company. And it was great. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think I did really well. Um, and then I got fired. But this time it wasn't about culture fit. It was about something else. I'm working on a different talk for that. It's tentatively titled, when you're irresponsibly awesome. <laughs> so the last, the last anecdote that I wanna share about this four-pronged approach to changing culture is about solidarity. Um, I was working with a team building a web app and it was a relatively small team, but there were very few women. In fact, there was 0.075% representation of women. And that was really terrible to me. Uh, being a marginalized person myself, I felt that, well, I couldn't, I couldn't just let this injustice continue. Uh, in meetings and discussions, I often saw the opinions of women 
be completely ignored or sometimes interrupted and cut off. Uh, and come on, as an ally, that incensed me. Uh, and also as a product designer, that, 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 uh, that was tragic to me because this was a company that hired people to, intelligent people to do work and then they were ignoring the intelligence of those people. It didn't make sense to me. So I sent an email. I sent an email to the women and I said, ladies, I see your struggle. I said, ladies, I've been doing some analysis and I see that you're underrepresented. I see that you're being unheard. I see that people are simply using your gender to discount your ideas. I was like, ladies, let's change this. Si se puede, si se puede. We can do this. Who's with me? Nobody, nobody was with me. They replied to me, they were like, what problem? They're like, we don't see a problem. Maybe that was true. Some said, hey, you know, they're comfortable. Some said, oh, I don't see the problem. Some said, oh, I think this is a great work environment. Don't change a thing. I go, okay, that's okay. I got that one wrong. Um, and that happens too. But because I was doing measurement and analysis, I, uh, sorry, measurement and adjustment, I adjusted my approach to step back, to fall back. Because I'm, I'm not a missionary, I'm not a crusader. I saw an issue, I had a design uh, inspiration, and nobody wanted to take it, so I said, okay, cool, that's fine. Um, here's the thing, you know, let's see. I want to show you some names of people. None of these are mine. These are people smarter than me, but they're also people doing really interesting work in this realm. They're, these are people who are putting together very practical approaches to changing workplace culture. My approach is not so practical, but it is powerful. Uh, the bottom line is that you deserve to work in an environment that suits you. And it's, well, it's true, but it's hard. The bad news is that if you're gonna change your environment that's in a way that suits you, you're gonna have to be the designer. That's the bad news, it takes work. But the good news is that, well, now you've got four, <laughs> four approaches that may or may not get you fired, but four approaches that you can actually use coming from a design perspective to redesign the environment you're in. And I wish you luck. Thank you.